Hi, so um, let's get started. We're gonna be talking in this session about um, various, various patterns that we have found useful and a bit about the Patterns Project. And then we're also gonna talk um, about some things that aren't patterns yet, but we'd like to come find some patterns to solve them, I hope. Um, and I've just captured a picture for Twitter. Let's get going. <laughs> Wait, you should have announced that before. So, um, <clears throat> Daniel. Hello. I think, I think you've been around the longest of this merry band. <laughs> <laughs> What is yeah. what do, what is your single favorite pattern if you had to pick one? Um, so a pattern, by the way, is uh, just as an introduction, right? It's a set of proven solutions to existing problems, and then there is this community at the Inner Source Commons, which is Inner Source Patterns. And my favorite one, and there are there are several of them. Uh, indeed, I have the list now in front of me. I would say after certain experiences with different companies and so on, I would go for the trusted committer because this role is so, so important, like having uh, first people that they only have read access and then others that they have read and write access. That's, that's important because then the trusted committer is the one helping to to have this inner source way of working in the right way, proposing ways of working, style guides, uh, uh, mentoring people, newcomers, uh, helping them to, you know, learn how to do properly code review, etc. So trusted committer, that's my one. Excellent. Thank you so much. I usually take that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Okay, Russ, do you have a favorite pattern? Yeah, thanks, Denise. And uh, I'll do my best uh, pirate talk since I don't have the pirate attire. Uh, so uh, our, uh, Denise, me favorite pattern uh, be the inner source portal pattern. Uh, all right. <laughs> so uh, the, the inner source portal uh, pattern is about discoverability. Uh, I, I love it uh, because uh, what the inner source portal pattern says is to create a centralized listing of all uh, inner source projects of the company that people can opt into, oftentimes by checking in some metadata into their code repository, uh, indicating that, that this repository is open for inner source contributions. And then through an, uh, an automated process, all the repositories that, that check that in can be displayed in a nice, uh, a nice UI. Uh, for discovery. Uh, it's so important because for InterSource to have the impact that we want it to have, we need to enable people that don't already know each other to find each other where they have some shared concern around a shared project. And the InterSource uh, portal pattern has worked at multiple companies uh, for that discovery. And there's even uh, recently in, in the InterSource Commons, there's been a company that is uh, open sourced uh, their implementation of InterSource portal, which is also very exciting. So. Uh, the inner source portal pattern be me favorite pattern denise ah, <laughs> good job <laughs> all right wolfgang you got a pattern in mind ah uh, russ your pattern is not a feeble one but i have to start with capitan izquierdo <laughs> me favorite pattern be the trusted committer as well simply because it well I don't know, they're all important, but I think this one is, I mean, it's the central role. I have to admit, we call it, at Daimler, we call it maintainer. Um, it's basically the same thing. I know you can talk about what to call it, but uh, yeah, I mean, it. you know, these people are responsible for the repository. They reject a, or, or, or uh, accept the contributions they have to talk to people. They have to, you know, be nice if they reject one. You know, welcome all contributions, right, Russ? And uh, so, yeah, I'll follow ship with Capitan Izquierdo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and I'm going to talk about one myself, and I I'm going to go a different way. Um, I think my favorite pattern, and it's because it's been so useful to me in my career is what we call outside-in marketing. So outside-in marketing is the idea that sometimes when you're a change agent, 
it's hard enough just to explain this desired state and get people to see the vision you're talking about. Almost always you are dodging cannonballs, right? <laughs> I always tell the story about being in Sun when, when open source was a new thing and somebody tried to fire me every quarter. I, I managed to survive for six years, but I got really good at avoiding those cannonballs, right? One of the ways that I got around that was essentially by taking my career into my own hands and um, getting the public to show Sun how what the way they were messaging, the way they were thinking about the future was not what people wanted to hear. It wasn't satisfying the market. So there was a shift going on in those years around trying to get the, the message that you gave, first of all, not to be segmented because the internet means that you, everybody can see every message that you're giving. <laughs> and if they're not exactly in sync, it's kind of embarrassing, but that was, that was new news to most of the marketers that were working at Sun at that time. In the case of me, I got very adept at accurately stating whatever the corporate policy was. And then I would take a step to the right or left on the stage and I would say, but this is what I think. And what I thought was not always in perfect agreement with whatever the market plan was. Um, and then I'd go back, in, you know, I'd circle back in my talk and re-emphasize that they have reasons for their position, but it gave this, it gave the internal people an opportunity to see the different reaction that the massaged message versus an authentic message from a practitioner, how those two landed in people's ears. It's always better to have the public or the audience tell the company rather than you having to carry that message as an individual because you are a target. It's easy to target you. It's much harder to target everybody else, right? But it does take a certain kind of uh, risk appetite <laughs> <laughs> to pull this off. Um, and so I'm just gonna say it's it's one of those caveat patterns uh, that, that maybe isn't for everyone. Yeah? yeah we should call you Captain Cannonball Dodging <laughs> Cooper. <laughs> Children in America play this game called Dodgeball. At least that we used to. Did you play it, Russ? Oh, oh yeah, Dodgeball is great. Yeah, Dodgeball is a real game. They have these nice rubber cannonballs. <laughs> yeah. Well, the kids throw at each other. Well, the best Dodgeball is played on trampolines. And yeah. sometimes when you're a change agent as a company, it's kind of what it feels like. You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not only dodgeball, but dodgeball on on trampolines, and uh, yeah, I think what you say is 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 true. But I've I found uh, like you that the uh, the rewards are uh, are are worth it in being a in being a change agent. There's a real inner satisfaction. I think it's one of the things that draws me to InnerSource is it's not only a wonderful way to get things done; it's a wonderful way to live as a person like you know, i'm living in my career at least eight hours a day if not more and so are all my peers it's a significant portion of our life and inner source is just a way to take that portion of our life and make it so much happier through uh enabling and empowering individual engineers you know through being able to you know, cross contribute it's it's just a wonderful thing so it's, it's worth the cannonball dodging that it that it may bring i agree this is this authenticity once you've had it you can't go back and, yeah. and open source does that too. Uh, once engineers have really worked in open source, they don't want to go back to working in the in the salt mines, right? Right. <laughs> so, right, right. And that's a good thing because you get better con contribution out of them. Yep. So, yeah. Excellent. All right. So now let's talk a bit more about um, challenges, which was going to be our second thing to talk about. So um, tell me, mateys. <laughs> 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 What's the hardest thing you've had to deal with in in trying to implement InnerSource, uh, either at somebody's company or at your own company? And we'll go the other way. Well, if you're first. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm I'm trying to think what was the hardest because that I tell you there are many shallows and. Uh, I said that in my talk, many legal shallows, you know, because I mean, see, on the one side, you know, legal people need to make sure that everything is okay and they have to, that's their job. 
but they shouldn't you know prevent innovation and now engineers want to drive forward innovation but they can't do that at the expense of the company you know to threaten the company so it's always a sort of a struggle back and forth you know and um so i have learned a lot of things about legal issues that i wasn't aware of existed of tax issues right um you know transfer pricing and taxes and uh i think our legal and governance people have learned a lot about engineers you know because at the very beginning of our open source journey they they you know <laughs> this is kind of funny because the you know the legal people said you want to do what you want to give away <laughs> software for free that we you know created in our company on our dime you want to give that away for free are you you're not serious right and uh then you know we they had nothing to do with open source before they had no idea right right and, uh, and so we explained it to them we sat down and talked and explained to them you know and after a while they said so you're actually serious right you want to do this <laughs> and and so yes but then you know then they understood the reasons why so so i'll say this i guess getting the you know the former old world and old world thinking getting that towards the new thinking the open and inner source way of thinking as that i think was the hardest part to overcome at first you know and in inner source as well because formerly you know project teams were isolated we're doing and you cannot see our code right and we're not helping you to write your code and you know that kind of thinking i think all details aside but that was the hardest part to overcome to get the mind mind uh, uh, the, the change in mindset going to start that path so. yeah that totally resonates with me <laughs> <laughs> i'm and i'm betting with the rest of the panel Mm -hmm. that, that's thank you that's a really good one mm. okay um let's see let's get daniel to speak second oh so then i, I go next so definitely I next. Agree with with uh wolfgang like legal and taxes that's that's kind of a really new world uh, a new pirate world that we need to to deal with and and do some hacking there and um, it's about converting right the lawyers and all the legal stuff and and uh, that they are blockers from blockers to facilitators right so how how to move them from a no 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 you are not doing this to something like well you are helping the organization to move forward so how, how can we work all together um what i've seen is that uh, once you remove this a barrier from the discussion the budget or the money or the taxes or so then things are much much simpler just one thing uh but but i would go for for another challenge um and this is this is basically based on experience talking to people at the at the inner source common right um and, and this is about when companies are ready to go to start an inner source journey and and this this needs of uh alignment from the chief level right from people uh uh, up there making decisions and driving the organization to, to the right path. Um, and then at the same time, uh, developers that they feel that they should be working in a different way with, with other type of tools, uh, processes and so on. So the first time I heard about this, and that was very, very true, was by Denise and Silona and some more people from the, from the community, right? It's, it's the so-called uh, air cover and ground cover. So we need both worlds just to keep advancing things, right? So we need uh, what Denise said before, right, about the their outside marketing. So it's about you need certain support from the from the upper management, but then at the same time you need ambassadors that that help drive all of this. And and I would like to to bring perhaps kind of a new pattern, which is not not only outside marketing but inside marketing, with the goal of giving the token the uh, the stage to people to people within the corporation saying hey we are doing this we are working in this way and this is our view of how we should be working right um and that's another challenge which is and then i will talk about the challenges here if you allow me which is uh, uh being afraid of failing sometimes failing is not uh, uh something that can happen in certain corporations 
And that's something that we need all to learn because if we are trying to foster innovation, for instance, with inner source, we need to allow people to fail at some point because they, they we, we, we will learn probably faster if we are all failing, right, at some point. So that's my thing. Yeah, it's hard. And this is this is something that's very hard to explain to management, but it we have seen it at InterSource Commons that if you're willing to share your failures with the rest of the InterSource community, everybody benefits. And you know, I've told you guys many times that one of my dreams for InterSource Commons was that it would trick companies that weren't yet doing open source into doing that through the means of InterSource because except for you know, GitHub, GitLab, and, and Atlassian, it's nobody's secret sauce. It should be everybody's everybody's common practice, right? And um, that th one of the things that we really believe in is sharing both successes and failures. And that's why we have anti-patterns in the pattern repository as well. So thank you very much for that, Daniel. Now, Russ, you got one? Uh, yeah, I have, I have several uh, challenges. <laughs> and I, I think it's in the same... Uh, uh, a thrust of what we heard from Wolf earlier, uh, but expanded a little bit. I think within a corporation, uh, usually there's uh, certain people that are responsible for one aspect of that corporation running well. And Wolf, you gave one of them, which is you know tax and and legal. And that person's job is to make sure that that you know tax and legal things work well. Uh, you know, so as they pursue their job, they're wondering. How does InterSource relate to this? And it's a, a model that's unfamiliar. It immediately raises questions, and uh, it's it's something that's new that you know hasn't necessarily proven out on a large scale that they've been able to see before. And I see that that same aspect happen in other areas where people are responsible for one singular part of the company. And the the two that I'll I'll, I'll talk about are uh, security, and then uh, you know our functional business leaders. And when you, when you bring a concept like inner source, it talks about you know broad collaboration. People, to some degree, kind of you know having some some agency about about where they spend their time and where their code goes. As a functional business leader, you know I'm rightfully you know, I might rightfully wonder how is that going to affect my ability to deliver uh, what my technology org is committed to the to the business. And uh, that's a, a challenge I'm I'm still working on on overcoming. You know, I'm aiming to show through data that we can prove you know correlation and causation between inner source behavior and then throughput of business deliverables. But uh, thus far, the, the the growth that I've had has been uh, more in kind of people that feel it in their gut, or there's enough anecdotes or stories of how this is helpful that people kind of get it and make space for that. And that's taken the efforts that I'm at, you know, a long way. You know, I work, you know, literally with thousands of people that are engaged in in collaborative behavior at Nike uh, and InterSource. But to to really kind of have it um, kind of take over and be the way that normal work uh, happens, you know, reaching that scale, I think, is going to require a greater ability to articulate uh, and articulate through data and not just anecdote and testimonial. You know the of the benefits that we all feel of of inner source. Uh, so there's that, and then uh, security. I think is interesting too. You know we've had conversations. It's like you know what you want everyone at the company to be able to see this the source code. You know what <laughs> is that? Right. Uh, you know uh, you know secure by default it says uh, okay we should have principal least privilege. Who really needs to see it? And when I come back and say well everyone needs to see it. You know, of course, and, uh, there's a, you know, really? Uh, and uh, when you think about someone whose job it is to, to keep uh, assets of the company secure, I think they're rightfully wondering how InterSource plays, uh, uh, plays against that. So in, in, in both of those, I think in addition to tax, it's, it's interesting when you have someone that's responsible for a singular part of the business and, and then InterSource comes in, they're wondering how InterSource relates to it. And since InterSource is so... Uh, so fundamental, so transformative, which is why it's so powerful. It also means it touches up against all of these people in their particular area, and and those are two uh, where I think there's been a challenge, but also clear uh, clear ways ways forward. Yeah, so you guys picked really good ones, good challenges. Um, I will say that, I mean, I'm older than all of you. I've been in this industry a long time now, and what I can see is a decided trend 
in the direction. I think the whole industry works in pendulums. Some of you have heard my pendulum theory. We go to extremes, right? Centralized, decentralized is a, is a common one. Um, but there are others. And one of them is um, we place the power in the hands of the makers or we place the power in the hands of the bean counters. And I'm, I'm, I'm using that people who work as lawyers and accountants, you know, that sounds pejorative, but I'm just trying to come up with a way to say not the people actually directly making the stock, the, all of the back office. And I think to the extent that we go in the industry to an extreme in the direction of, of allowing administration to rule how things are done, we kill off a lot of the joy of doing the work. Um, I had the privilege to work for both Apple and Sun Microsystems. Both of those companies were more than willing to innovate, more than willing to come up with interesting new shit and then figure out how to make it a business. And I also worked for Intel who had a lot of resources, a lot of smart people and a lot of ways to look at innovation but nine times out of 10, they would take an innovative idea to, to understand it. They would explore it, but they would never actually go into the business of doing that work because they were so nervous about triggering antitrust. And if you look at Intel today, they spend a lot of time focusing on a very narrow expertise, which is they, are not, they have now lost the plot, a big company like that, right? So. I think that companies do well to try to allow innovation and not stifle it and allow original thought and in pushing forward against the desire for everything to all the beans to be counted. Um, Tim O'Reilly said it to us 20 years ago when open source was new. He said, the secret to happiness is create more value than you monetize, leave some stuff on the table, give people an opportunity to go there especially the really creative people in your company. And I mean, that's, that's what, may, we're, we're not cogs in a wheel. Engineers are not cogs in a wheel. We're painters, we're artists, we're pirates. We need to be able to swash and buckle. <laughs> and that is frightening to some people, but what the triumph of open source has companies that would not normally look in this direction, trying to figure out how to walk that plank, if you will between business as usual and losing any hope of future, you know, growth, right? And right. I think that um, more and more, we've seen the rising tide of Intersource. It's clearly on people's minds. And we have an opportunity to help some of the, some of the poor lovers that are working in these salt mines to get on the boats with us. Right. So thank you guys. I think that we're just about out of time.